Welcome to Span 312 Hopscotch, a Latin American Literature in Translation. And today I'm delighted to have uh, with me Professor Licia Fiol Mata, who is professor at uh, New York University and is the author, amongst uh, many other things, of, of this book uh, on Gabriela Mistral, a queer mother, a mother for the nation. Um, this is subtitle two The State and Gabriela Mistral. And uh, but we're going to talk uh, specifically ab about this collection, Mad Women, the Locas Mujeres of Gabriela Mistral, as well as perhaps more generally about some of the uh, twists and turns in Gabriela Mistral's uh, reputation. So, uh, Professor Fiolmata, uh, thank you so much uh, for doing this. Uh, it's really a great pleasure uh, to meet you and to be talking to you uh, about Mistral. And, and my first question is is very open. It's simply. How would you suggest approaching Mistral and particularly this set of poems, this collection? Thank you, John, for inviting me to the course. I'm very happy to be here. How would I approach Mistral and the Locas Mujeres? Uh, I tend to, to work with um, genealogically, so I like to see how it's been read. And I'm not claiming to have done an exhaustive because... Uh, the Mistral bibliography is enormous. It spans many, many decades uh, since when she was alive, accelerated after her death in 1957. You can imagine and, and, and scattered in books. I have run into special issues in different parts of the world, uh, not to mention her voluminous uh, set of manuscripts, et cetera. So not exactly uh, prepared to go through all of it. And uh, it would take a long time. But certainly, uh, just to point out where we're coming from with these poems, uh, as many critics have said, Mistral's uh, son, Jin Jin, uh, died in 1943. And because these poems were published much later, people thought that the madness it allude, they allude to was due to the death of the son. And, and that influenced the readings of the poems for decades. Uh, recently, some scholars have uh, debunked this narrative and I've, I've run into some very interesting articles, even genetic criticism articles uh, that obviously show that many of the poems were written before uh, Juan Miguel Godoy committed suicide and therefore had nothing to do with that event, couldn't have. Uh, many uh, appeared in La Nación de Buenos Aires, not all, but some, between 1941 and 1943. There is an excellent article by uh, a scholar with the last name of Castillo, published in Chile about this. Um, so that reception happened, right? Closer to our times, after several important studies by Jorge Guzmán, Patricio Marchant, and naturally the, the watershed event of the publication of Una Palabra Complice in the late dictatorship and into the transition, obviously this uh, reception changed significantly, right? There were on the one hand psychoanalytic readings of the Locas Mujeres that still depended on the category of experience, which is a very important category that I'm very interested in, uh, the relationship of experience to the poetry, but, but took it a little, to literally sometimes, uh, and uh, and then the feminist reappraisal of Mistral, which was uh, the importance of that is uh, can be overstated. It te there are I I, I don't want us to see this as a homogeneous phenomenon because it wasn't, but naturally there was a tendency to see a reaffirmation of women's creativity, a creation you know of an audience of women that the locas mujeres. Uh, um, addresses itself to, right? Obviously the refusal of patriarchy, all of all things that are naturally part, you no, know, of the Locas Mujeres readings, and, and we don't need to like reject them wholesale. Uh, but for me, then as I, I mentioned to you before, the cycle it just refuses, you know, all those interpretations in significant ways. You mentioned it in your lecture. It's a highly unsettling cycle. 
uh, and, and following some more recent gender and queer studies criticism, because I think that the most important message I want to give out to the students and anybody watching this is that we have to respond to the critical time. So even, even queer studies or feminist studies or dissident feminist studies, all of which I personally am aligned with, have to respond to more recent interventions into questions of binarism, you know, the gender binary, so-called fluidity, a, a word that I don't use much, but I respect, um, the troubling of gender, not just the gender trouble that Judith Butler spoke about a while ago, but, uh, but accepting that these categories and even our more progressive understandings of them must change with the times. So that's how I'm approaching the Locas Mujeres now, right? Um, it's a fascinating collection. In itself, it's gone through several versions, as I think you alluded to, right? The first poem is very, very famous, La Otra. Um, in my own, I'm trying to study this cycle now, but I'm just beginning. Uh, I approach La Otra in particular from its uh, vast difference from the poesia intimista that was prevalent at the time and that was virtually the only poetic capacity allowed women or recognized as possibly having been written by a woman. And there are certain examples that are very good poems. I'm not trying to at all reject La Poesia Intimista, obviously not. But in Mistral, eh, it, again, it just doesn't work. She's at best a dissident of this poetry. I think you mentioned the word dissident in your lecture as well. Um, but certainly La Otra lends itself to that. Una en mi mate, yo no la amaba. Uh, alludes to a, a split self, as you discussed, uh, and then opens up to what could be considered multiple selves. And you also mentioned that when she says uh, that the sisters you know, ask her uh, what happened to the one who was murdered. Is this poem was first separate from Locas Mujeres. It went through several lives. In the beginning, it was the first poem of the entire Lagar collection. And then it was moved to be the portal of Locas Mujeres in a separate section that was not at the beginning of the entire volume. Reputedly, Lagar was too long, and they asked her to split it up. Several scholars discussed this. And, and thus, Lagar too existed in uh, draft form, if you want to call it that, and when Mistral died, it hadn't been finished, and Doris Dana, who knew better than anybody else what Mistral's intentions were, continued working with it in consultation with experts, and it was eventually published in La Gartu, which included the other cycle of the Locas Mujeres, which I'm never sure if, for me, the Locas Mujeres is the original cycle. I guess I'm a little, very much into the published poetry as, the, as we know that the author saw it. But that's that's not necessarily, uh, I mean, that's just an impression at this point. Obviously, it does work in terms of the, the general cycle. And then when the legado, as it's called now, emerged in 2007, which I prefer to call the Doris Dana art card, but uh, it's not called that, it's called el legado. A number of poems appeared, many, many, many poems that had never been written or published anywhere. And they, so most of them were published in El Masigo a collection edited by the great Mr. Alien specialist, Luis Vargas Saavedra. Then the, the, the latter part of the poems that we see in this collection that you mentioned appeared in, in the original Almasigo, which has gone through a couple of editions. Um, Vargas Saavedra also thought that he found some poems that he called Locos Hombres. And many, many scholars have refuted this. And I, I, I also agree that there, that doesn't make any sense to consider a parallel cycle of Locos Hombres in Mistral. I don't think so. But anyway, that's a separate thing that we don't have to. So how do I approach with these poems? I don't know if you want me to keep on talking. I just started talking. The, uh, I mean, th this is great in, in, in some ways. No, I don't want to uh, in, interrupt. This is, you know, th this sort of panorama of, of the ways in which uh, Mistral and, and her poetry have been interpreted and appropriate. I think it's fascinating you saying that originally it's like look for the look for the man, the the miss, the, the the lost son, and so on. that somehow explains things. That that's that's kind of crazy, but um, indicative, right? That 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 might have been uh, 
the initial uh the initial uh, interpretation or, or reception and, and then and then the, the ways in which uh subsequent developments and, and uh archival developments and so on have, have constructed other other mistrals um uh, I I, th I think this is uh, uh, this is this is fantastic, and it's got I, perhaps it's got something to do with that resistance that you talk about in the poetry I itself. That the poetry resists any single interpretation, and, and therefore perhaps allows uh, allows for such appropriations. Is, is that fair? Well, it's interesting because for me, it. In general, Mistral's poetry is seen as very difficult to understand, eh, obscure. No, even the early poetry, although Grina Rojo considers Locas Mujeres part of her mature poetry, and I, I wanted to say something about that. Um, so in general, there's a resistance to reading the poetry, period, right? Not just the Locas Mujeres. Um, even the ch children's poems are, are hard to understand. So there's that quality in the Australian world, right? Of, but being resistant to interpretation or perhaps not even interested in interpretation. <laughs> uh, in terms of La Locas Mujeres, just to stay on a thread, um, for me, part of it is that trying to see um, an identification of Mistral with these characters that she builds is a mistake. I don't think that that was that is an evidence in the poems at all, except maybe in La Dichosa. But um, I think that this was really an exploration. It's almost an epistemology, no? Uh, I, I found a, a great quote, and if you don't mind, I would like to read from this article that I was uh, working with uh, by, I'm going to just tell you who it is, Jenny Aris Castillo. To 2019, published in Chile, um, is a person who did the genetic criticism approach. And she quotes a letter of Mistral's, in which Mistral says, no, about the locas mujeres, el adjetivo no significa aquí cosa alguna peyorativa. Precisamente yo me decido en la vida por las locas a causa de que las cuerdas me parecen demasiado insípidas. That's a quote from Mistral, no? So that the, the so-called cuerdas and, and square quotes are bland and the so-called locas are interesting. So it's an object of attention. It, it captures our attention. It's an inquiry into something. And that's, that's how I approach the cycle. I also think that it's worthwhile considering this with newer uh, theoretical approaches. And uh, there are many, but I have two in mind. One is Jack Halberstam. Jack Halberstam, whom I followed in my queer mother, is uh, the author of Female Masculinity. Since then, he has published an array of great books. But his latest book is called Wild Things, The Disorder of Desire. And I think that Jack's um, analysis of many, many modernist texts, and scholars have noticed that Mistral has affinities with modernism as in English. No modernism, Yates, Pounds, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Green Rojo mentioned it in 1997. In, in his book, Miran que está en la Gloria Mistral, and other, other people have mentioned it too, it's not hard to detect. But uh, what Halberstam does is that he focuses on, on the entropy, you know, or the disorder of modernism. And I feel that the Locas Mujeres is precisely about that, you know, disordering desire or creating an entropy in poetic terms. And that has become my approach. Uh, Halberstam talks about a post-natural world, but not in the sense of celebrating a queer post-natural world or anything like that, but rather focusing on the boundary. And I think that even the trajectory of the Locas Mujeres is an exercise in boundaries. That's why I mentioned that La Otra was first separate then it was joined. Some people think the last three points shouldn't have been. Marti Maria and the other ones don't really belong. And they, they do seem a little disjointed. And then this other cycle was added. And then other points have been added. And there's a discussion about where it begins and where it ends. But that's it doesn't begin or end. That is its nature. And we cannot domesticate the cycle. 
and that's why where I where I find them resistant and and preoccupied with that, right? Um, so that, for example, in the one that I'm working with the most, Electra en la Niebla, it was published posthumously. I, I believe in the 60s, but I, I don't remember exactly when it was first published, but it was it was much later than when Mistral died. And it is now universally recognized as one of her greatest poems. And she's got a few, but it's very hard to understand what's going on in the poem. It's, it's, it's tough. Silvia Molloy in 1991, spoke about Electra la Niebla as a reversal or an inversion of the myth, the Greek myth. And that there's something of that. And she, say, she stated back then that the poem posited, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I get all the characters mixed up, posited Electra as the author of the murder of the mother, right? And not Orestes. Even if Orestes was a material author, she's the actual author. And that's been taking up in psychoanalysis quite a lot in terms of refining the Electra myth um, or the Electra complex, which uh, of course is a discredited thing, but some people have tried to um, take a hold precisely of the fact that the Electra complex can never be. It can never be. It doesn't make sense semantically. It doesn't make sense psychoanalytically. And for example, Elizabeth von Samsono or Samsono. Anyways, the book is called Anti Electra The Radical Totem of the Girl. And that's an example of something that can be useful in approaching Mistral. And she also talks like Halberstam about those boundaries separating the human and the non-human, which as we know, is a major preoccupation of today, right? That we cannot ignore, we can't accept, you know? So, and she also talks instead of motherhood, she talks about motherness, motherness, no? And then quoting, the symbolic order of motherness cultivates openness to the transhuman and integrates the animal partner, which I find fascinating because we know that in Mistral poems in general, in her oof, there are many animals that appear, right? One of the most famous is El Huemul, which is was taken up as a very beautiful slogan in the Estallido Social, eh, as a pacifist slogan, no? But there are sweet of animals that appear. In, part, in Poema de Chile, the poetic voice is accompanied by, I believe, our mul, although I may be mistaken with the animal. <laughs> uh, but but there is an animal, it's a dyad of a child voice and an animal, right? So all, for me, the Locas Mujeres should be approached with these boundaries in mind. In Electra en la Niebla, we assume that the speaker is Electra, right? But, but are we certain that it's her voice? No. Um, and I'm not just talking about it being Orestes, precisely, no. As in una especie de voz travestida, although there's something of that. But rather, a, what kind of voice is it? No. Uh, going to this uh, transhuman, post-natural concept in Halberstam, and I'm just, I'm just skipping, no, I'm just, I'm just skimming the top of this because in Halberstam there are many, many great ideas that could be uh, um, usefully, you know, and I, that's what I'm kind of doing with uh, Locas Mujeres and also the so-called nature poems of Mistral. It's also uh, the case that that corpus has been very, very difficult for critics and they kind of domesticate it, you no, know, into certain narratives. And they, they, they still do, but but that's, for me, they're missing the point. Uh, I mean, that's terrible to say that, but for me, there is something way more crucial in these poems, and that's why they're so difficult to read, okay? Um, um, so that in Electra, there are, for example, certain marks where there's some kind of dialogue going on that are very, very mysterious. If we go to the poem, the, the poem is very long, right? They're almost at the end of the poem. This, um, some kind of dialogue or indication of dialogue appears, you know? Where it says, because she, you hear her, she's calling, etc. may the God then move you. That's also for me, an instance of this, this boundary this, that's very unsettling. Where do things begin? Where do things end? At one point she says, Electra Orestes, Orestes Electra. That has been noticed by critics too. But what is going on in terms of eh, gender or the binary of gender there? It's not just a simple 
substitution, as in the trope, the classic trope, the revolving door, etc. There is a search for uh, it's a it's like a an investigation, an inquiry, an inquest into something, you know, that has to do, and that's not yet there. There's a kind of futurity that has also has been studied recently in queer studies and in other studies. You know, a, a temporality that seems ominous to most people because they can't place it, but it's not necessarily ominous. You no, know? it, it doesn't have a plus or a plus or a minus mark. Uh, that's the, the idea of motherness that I, I cited from the book Anti Electra. It's also interesting. Some people have spoken of the end of the mother. Jack Halberstam speaks of the end of queerness. Uh, the end, the end, the end. Everybody is uh, preoccupied with this with a, with a good reason. But recasting that whole very prescriptive and normative experience, and not just the discourse, but the experience of motherhood, is something different that doesn't dispense, however with the intimate uh, that some people have seen, and I think you quoted it, intimacy or the intimate as extimate. I think you quote an article mm -hmm. in your, in yep. your uh, which is a play with boundaries, although it's not exactly what I'm referring to, even though I, I do enjoy Lacan quite a lot. Uh, that's what I would look for now in the Locas Mujeres, you know? a away from one, assuming that Mistral identifies, oh, I know the other thing I wanted to say before we end, Instead of the emphasis on the madness, the locas, I would emphasize the mujeres, uh -huh. but not as the celebration. For example, Raquel Olea, who is a very well-known critic and a foremost critic of Gabriela Mistral, no? uh, for her, she's, she's studying the locas mujeres cycle. And for her, it's a very important cycle precisely because it's part of a lineage of women's creativity, women's resistance, and all women's power, et cetera. But for me, eh, and that's perfectly acceptable, of course, but for me, the mujeres in locas is a question. It's not an answer. It's, um, it's, an, it's an inquiry. It's a, it's a search for something that is not really what the signifier has up to now represented, right? Definitely not in Gabriela Mister's time. There were very little idioms, as we know, for, for poets who happen to be born female uh, to inhabit, right? Uh, and Gabriela Mistral knew that well. And that's, I think, the quest or the journey of the Locas Mujeres. So that the, what is the Mujeres? Who is Electra, no? Or even Orestes? I mean, they're not a stable thing, no? And in the return to the classics, that's a very modernist move, as Green or Rojo analyzed years ago. Uh, the anachronism or the return to antiquity, et cetera. But I, I also found in my research and reading several people, no, including this anti electro that blood and milk were very important in antique, no, uh, classic literary texts. They reappear a lot, which explains Mistral's recurring use of blood and milk. There's a beautiful poem in, in Ternura, uh, Canción de la Sangre. It's a, one of her most um, amazing poems. Uh, but instead of seeing it as some kind of reflection of her own insatisfaction, uh, or dissatisfaction rather, or um, failure, or all those things that have been said about Mistral that uh, I talked about and are, are still somewhat prevalent in some criticism, uh, instead of seeing it as something personal in that way, it's more an intimacy with texts, right? And they are related to experience, of course, no? But not in, not that way, no? She's a Benjaminian at heart. There is a strangeness, no? Uh, an aura, if you want to call it that, to the text that is about shattering, disordering, and finding only in that illumination, flash, no, that Benjamin discusses in passages and book uh, that you kind of have to tune into and capture only from within your historic time, which is why I think it's so important to go to accept the challenges of our time and, and, and accept the changes, even in things that we hold dear, such as uh, feminist criticism, or studies, etc. And, and I think that's why Mistral is so such an icon 
why she, I don't know how, and I don't know why this happens in some cases, but certainly happens in hers, a, appropriated by many different sectors, we know, but capable, no, of provoking that Benjaminian moment or experience. So, so for me, Locas Mujeres is definitely super important. I'm so happy that you're teaching it, but I'm, I, would, I would urge people to question those narratives of the mujeres. Uh, and of course, madness is a, an important trope, naturally, but as you pointed out in your lecture, sometimes you, you wonder why they're called locas mujeres, right? Why is why are they mad or why are they categorized as mad? No, and in her own citation, it's because of the interesting possibilities of these uh, characters, that they're not bland, that they hold her attention, that there's a moment in which she encounters some really nice uh, testimonials in the letters, et cetera, about wow, how she wrote, I don't know, uh, La Tullida, or how she wrote, that there are moments of encounter, really, that then she transformed into poetry that really don't have anything to do much to do with her experience. Anyway, another thing that I want to say before we go is that the entire, we have to, we can't forget that Gabriela Mistral herself, you know, and this happened when the Legado came out, this, I discuss this in my new prologue to my queer mother, translated into Spanish, signed some of her intimate letters as Gabriel, uh, Gabriel, you know? And uh, this wasn't Gabriele D'Annunzio, <laughs> this was her referring to herself in masculine gender, Gabriel, you no know, Gabriel. Uh, I don't think we can forget that when we go to Loga Mujeres, you no? Know? I think, uh, I also cannot forget that some of its filial language was very common in lesbian subcultures, right? Referring to people as madres and hermanas and other familial metaphors. Uh, there's a degree of parity too in the locas mujeres. They're not as solemn as some people think they are. Not even Electra la Niela, which of course is about a matricide, but there's a, a level of play and mischief that I think would go a long way recognizing that so that people can really approach the poems on their, without you know, this prejudice that we've all been taught, not just with Mistral, but with women poets in general. Anyways, I've spoken too much. I hope I didn't bore you. <laughs> it, not at all. This has been uh, extraordinarily uh, uh, rich and, and survey right of, of many different ways in, in which to, to to think about these poems and provoking us to think about them uh, uh differently to to really think um seriously about them i want we're really out of time but i do want to ask one very last very quick question because because we talked about it briefly before we, we started recording and, and it, i think it connects to what you were saying about the challenge of our time you were talking about i suppose the challenge of normalization um and perhaps especially as there seems to be a, a renaissance, again, another renaissance in interest in, in, in Mistral and um, and your translation, the, the, the translation of your book will no doubt uh, foment that further too. Um, and I wonder if, uh, if you could say a little bit about that danger or worry uh, uh, about normalization and, and its relationship to, uh, to, to Mistral. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, um, in my prologue, my new prologue, I'm talking especially about when the archive emerged, the Mistral, more recent 2007, super important archive that, by the way, you can consult through the Biblioteca Nacional Digital de Chile. They've done an amazing job. It's, it's unbelievable, everything that they've actually been able to digitize. So um, check out those contents if you're interested. But what to do with that, like, for example, with Gabriel, right? There were even comical attempts to normalize this. Uh, and, you know, I wrote about it, so I'm not going to talk about it now. But also, um, what does the queer identity now accept it? Some people don't want to accept it, but it's inevitable. You have to do it. When, when does it become something uh, titillating or to sell or... Um, to celebrate by alighting the fissures, right? Um, 
what are we doing when we now we signify this icon uh, on the surface accepting her queerness, right? That's that's my my question. So for example, I love the mural by Fab Siraolo, I think it's terrific, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, that was commissioned by the GAM, which is a spectacular center uh, in Santiago that is named after Gabriela Mistral, the Gabriela Mistral Center, the GAM, uh, as, they, as they call it, Centro Cultural Gabriela Mistral. But then um, there are other approaches. There's a, a theater piece where she's being queried by the new generation because she wasn't feminist enough. Uh, those, those kinds of things... Uh, I think we need to discuss them, no? Um, what do we expect the icon to do, the work to do today? Um, what kind of queerness are we accepting? Is it the queerness that reinforces the state vision of the family? Is it like the, the so-called, um, how should I put it, clean version of homosexuality and lesbianism? Uh, people who have children, people who raise their children a certain way, people who uphold the morals, et cetera. Uh, what I referred to 20 years ago, citing Lisa Dugan, the great uh, critic, theorist, uh, historian as uh, homonormativity. But what she meant was not that all forms of homosexuality were susceptible, but rather certain strata of folks who wanted to, wanted membership and wanted inclusion say, in circles that really were not to the benefit of most queer people or even women, right? And we see that now also in feminism, the so-called feminismo de derechas, which I still don't understand all that well, but I know exists, or certain forms of separatist feminism now that are very conservative, not like the separatist feminism of the 60s or 70s. They work to different ends. So that's more or less what I was talking about in terms of normalizing in terms of the Mistral archive, um, there was a, a, a real danger that some of the contents could be altered, right? We know that there's a long history of privatization of Mistral's sources, particularly her letters. Camille Lersou uh, in the 90s spoke of a Mistral police. Uh, that's her word, that's her phrase. Uh, and who, who hoarded you know, letters and collected them, but didn't make them available to researchers and periodically would release these uh, in books that had funny signatures because sometimes they were signed by the collector and not by Mistral, which is odd because they were Mistral letters. Uh, and and all, all that attempt to control, you know, the reception or control or, or do a sort of quote unquote damage control when certain things came out, right? Like for example, the Francisco Casas project that was never realized that he was gonna make a biopic, but he wasn't deemed suitable. I discussed that uh, to, um, to write about the Nobel Prize winner, you know? what, he's, what was he gonna do with her, right? But anybody can do whatever they want with her. <laughs> you know, she's nobody's property. And then you can judge the artwork if you want. I also wanted to remind your students that there's a movie called Locas Mujeres, since we were talking about that cycle um, by Maria Elena Wood. It's actually a very good film, but it's also odd in terms of normalizing, you know? Uh, there, are, there are some odd moments in the film because somehow the madness uh, narrative uh, reappears in a movie that can be more than 10 years old at best, or maybe, not, I, I think it's about 10 years old, uh, where the, the Jin Jin narrative re resurfaces, right? And, and then a good portion of the movie is uh, linking Doris Dana, uh, her loss of her father, I believe, but don't quote me on that, I'm, I can't remember exactly, to the loss of Jing Jing, and then that's the kind of normalization that doesn't that that also cements this vision of gender, no? In this case, as abject, right, and and perpetually immature, which is also an interesting thing of Locas Mujeres and Electra, because the Electra and the Electra complex and all that that was discussed uh, eons ago had to do with Electra supposed immaturity, and she's an adolescent, and and. And it's kind of stuck in that mode. And I find it very interesting that some people describe Locas Mujeres as a mature poems <laughs> of Mistral when all of Mistral's published poems is mature in that sense. It's all accomplished. But in this later poetry, 
maturity itself is a question. You know, the idea that uh, that is something to be fixed or, or and particularly the child. For me, the voice in Electra Nera, even though she's called Electra, is really a child, you know? The child voice that she's uh, recurs to. Anyway, so children, the target of normalization for sure, children. Mm-hmm. In my fair mother, I call for better studies of children, period, that they deserve better studies. And uh, and certainly Juan Miguel Godoy, I mean, for, oh my God, what they did with him uh, in, the, in criticism, nobody talked about him. He was a he was unimportant, which is something that I try to redress in my queer mother, and more recently has also received some attention. So anyway, those are some of my ideas about normalization. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. We, we, we need to stop. Of course, Mistral interested in, in, in children and, and, and education, but I like the notion that it's worth returning to Mistral, if nothing else, to dislodge our complacency that we sometimes think that we we've uh, we know better, you know that the Mistral still uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, that. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Licia. Uh, this has been a, a fantastic conversation, really rich, uh, uh, really great. I've learned a lot, and um, and and I'm sure others will. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John, and thank you for teaching the locas mujeres a Mistral. <laughs>